Hello, everyone, and welcome back from our break, uh, getting started with the next round of presenters. Next up, we have Adrian Hill of the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory presenting on a reusable autonomy engine that supports applied physics lab missions from low Earth orbit to deep space. Adrian, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Brandon. All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, yeah, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, my name is uh, Adrian Hill. As Brendan mentioned, I, I work here at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. I'm going to talk about a reusable autonomy engine that we've used at a variety of missions to handle a lot of our onboard fault management. Um, I've, I've been at APL for about 20 years and worked in, in space even longer than that. I was worked at Goddard Space Flight Center before that. Um, and for the last uh, few missions, I have worked primarily in, in our autonomy systems. Uh, before that, I was flight software lead on various missions at APL and and before APL. Uh, and to talk a little bit ab about autonomy and our autonomy engine. So, so we have in our software a reusable autonomy engine that we move from mission to mission. And the engine is, is fairly simple in that it is a, it's a monitor response style system, as I like to call it, where the monitors run at a one hertz rate, where we evaluate onboard telemetry at a one hertz rate and take action if there are faults. Um, the onboard engine um, supports what we call this uh, autonomy or autonomy engine supports these four constructs that we use to build a, a robust autonomy system for handling and responding to onboard faults. And the, the four components are called autonomy rules, macros, storage variables, and computed telemetry. And I'll kind of talk about each of those and how they tie together and then kind of show an example. Um, but first, our autonomy rules. And these are the expressions that define the potential, the, the uh, fault condition that we are looking for. And they can use any combination of onboard spacecraft telemetry, along with common arithmetic and logical operators. So when we, when we write an autonomy rule, and this will be a rule that we're actually going to load to the spacecraft, it'll look something like this. It's a very C-like syntax. Um, and when we define the condition we're looking for, in this case, it's looking for a spacecraft in operational mode and we're in some kind of a low power condition. We can also define some additional attributes about how long it must persist an M of N counter for five of six seconds, um, how many times that rule could refire after it does fire the first time. And then some other attributes, priority and initial state that we can uh, further refine how an autonomy rule works in our system. So, but the key is this expression, and it's kind of a free form field that it can be you know, ar arbitrarily long. And this is an example from a real mission of a very simple expression um, that's looking for a sun sensor overcurrent condition. So it's looking at spacecraft telemetry here against this limit. Um, the, the range of, of operators and operands is very much like C. So these are the list of operators we have. We have arithmetic, bitwise, logical, and relational operators. Um, constants, just like you would see in, in a C language, and the onboard spacecraft telemetry points um, referenced symbolically. So we're able to combine those in any arbitrary condition to define an autonomy rule. Um, a more complex example, and this is probably more typical what we see when we, def when we define autonomy rules, it, it's looking at various things. If, if this is off, if this temperature is less than this, if the heater if maintain heater's flag is true, if the spacecraft is operational, if temps are valid, so we can combine um, as many individual telemetry points um, that we need to come up with, with the expression for the condition that we're trying to detect. And here are the other attributes associated with rules about how long, for example, the condition must persist, in this case, 60 out of 66 samples. This would have to be true before we would act on it. Um, we have a related, uh, uh, I'll mention with autonomy rules, kind of under the hood, when we write these um, expressions and build these rules, we have a, a tool that essentially compiles, for lack of a better word, compiles these underground into RPN, reverse Polish notation, or something we'll refer to, it, refer to it as operator postfix notation. So our ground tools will, will put this in an RPN format and our flight software autonomy engine has an RPN stack for evaluating any arbitrary expression. So when we load this rule, this is how it's stored in flight software, and it will evaluate in RPN this condition every second. Um, we have a very um, closely related construct that we call computed telemetry. 
And this is really almost like if you're familiar with derived symmetry processing on the ground, this is where we can create intermediate or define intermediate symmetry points on the spacecraft that aren't necessarily in needed symmetry. So a simple example might be, we might be interested in spacecraft power. There might be a, a symmetry point available that's power, but there may be a voltage from a voltage monitor, a bus current from a current monitor. And then we can define a new computed symmetry point. Um, we use the exact same expression, exact same syntax that we use for autonomy rules, where we can define it It'll again be loaded in this RPM format and flight software will evaluate it. And the advantage of the computed symmetry, once we load this formula, we can then use this resulting computed symmetry in our other autonomy. So it gives us that ability to create this derived telemetry for use in our autonomy system. And this is an example of a computed symmetry. And this is a simple one. It's looking to see if three or four separation signals indicate that we're separated. So it's kind of counting and seeing if at least three of the four indicate separated. And again, we, we could then use this in rules that need to operate if the spacecraft is separated. Um, the, the third construct are macros. And macros are just our list of spacecraft commands um, that are designed to address the fault. Um, uh, some these would be very analogous to RTSs, if you're familiar with that terminology. Um, and in our macros, any command that's available that can be executed on the spacecraft um, is available for use in our macros. Um, we also have the ability in our macros to have conditional logic. So we have if construct where we can say if some condition is true, you know, take some action, else some other action based on current telemetry. Um, so this is an example of a very simple macro that just has four commands. Um, from actually, this is actually a macro from a from a previous mission. Uh, but our macros, we have the ability can be more complex, and that we could have macros that call other macros. We could have macros with if statements and conditional logic. So, so we could have a fairly robust you know um, network of macros uh, when needed. Um, the, the fourth of our kind of the four-legged stool for autonomy is what we call storage variables. And these are just simply scratch pad variables that, that autonomy can set to a value, autonomy can increment them, can decrement them. Um, they can also be used as, as parameters where the ground can load a value and autonomy can act on that. Um, so for flight software, it's a very simple, just static storage location where autonomy can store information that needs to persist from one, one hertz um, execution cycle to the next. Um, and this is an example of a storage variable. It happens to be a, an LVS, a low voltage supply a battery threshold, and it's set to a value, in this case, of 30.27 as an example. Um, so kind of looking at it, tying it together. So the, the way our systems work, you know, the autonomy rules are our main mechanism for detecting faults. So those have the express the expressions that are going to detect faults. They have access to all of our onboard telemetry. Um, plus computed telemetry, those are the intermediate calculations. They have access to that same onboard telemetry. So we can define computed telemetry, and those outputs can then be used in autonomy rules. We have a storage variables, which are which can be constants or, or things that we use to store, in, store knowledge. And those can also be used in autonomy rules. And then when a rule triggers, it fires a macro. Um, that macro will send commands, which hopefully will address the fault condition. That macro can also modify storage variables and it can also read storage variables that can be used in conditional constructs. So um, this is kind of how, they, uh, how these objects tie together. So when we are building autonomy uh, for a mission, we are defining the individual rules, macros, computed symmetry, and storage variable for that mission. But the onboard engine uh, that runs in flight software is essentially the same. So we, we pick up that engine that's able to evaluate the RPN expressions, that's able to dispatch macros, and so on. Um, that's written in C. We pick that up and move that from mission to mission. Um, and we've moved it, we've run on RAD 6000s, RAD 750s, Leon processors, and so on. Uh, we're, able, we're able to reuse that, that engine from mission to mission. Um, some of the advantages of, the, of this is that um, one is each object is stored in RAM. You could think of that as the live object that's being acted on. There's also a copy of non-volatile memory. So whenever our processor reboots, these autonomy objects get copied from non-volatile memory to RAM and get acted on. Um, and 
And one real advantage is that we are able to load, modify, or delete these autonomy objects, either in RAM or non-volatile memory without requiring a change in flight software. I know at Hans and some people talked earlier about, you know, you know um, using software to fix problems and so on. So this really gives us a lot of flexibility because we can really significantly change the behavior of the system through our autonomy system without having to change the underlying flight software. We know making flight software changes is a you know, very expensive and a very risky proposition. Um, we could also change just individual objects. We could target changes to just the specific objects that we are changing and without affecting the other objects. And, and the other thing we can do, and, we, and we've done this many times, we can change our autonomy on the fly without having to disable autonomy. So we can have autonomy running on a spacecraft, we can load in new objects without having to even disable our onboard autonomy system, much less reboot software or anything like that. So, um, so it's, it's very dynamic in that sense. Um, so as a result, for most of our fault detection and responses on board our spacecraft, we implement almost all of that in autonomy. So you will not see a lot of, of, of fault detection and logic directly hard-coded in our flight software. Um, there are some cases where we do that, where, uh, where we need responses that are very quick, as an example, or maybe the responses are very complex that are beyond just simple series of spacecraft commands that we can send. But that's really the exception rather than the rule. These are the type of things we typically do implement in our autonomy system. Uh, you know, we may monitor load currents, temperatures, um, specific health checks for components, uh, manage redundancy, switching from A sides to B sides, um, safe mode demotions, uh, post-separation sequence. So that, that's pretty standard fare for, for what we load into our autonomy system. Uh, as, as far as developing autonomy, um, we have a team that's a team different than the flight software that is actually doing the development of the uploadable autonomy objects. And this is an example of a source file for an autonomy rule. This is actually a, an actual autonomy rule from a, from a currently flying mission. And, and this, is, this is what it looks like where this is the expression. Uh, the expression can span multiple lines. It, it's concatenated together. And these are some of the other attributes associated uh, with that autonomy rule, how long it's got to be true. This is the response that's going to run um, if this rule trips. Uh, uh, so we build these and our other objects, macros, computed symmetry, storage variables have a similar type syntax. Um, and one advantage we get, we, we have a pretty robust rule or tool set associated with our autonomy system. Uh, so when we build our autonomy, we have kind of a single source of truth. So from those source files uh, that they're defining these rules and macros, we actually um, will auto-generate a web page, a hyperlink web page, and I'll show an example a little later, um, that has all of the autonomy objects. Um, and you can click on one object and, and navigate from one to another and so on. And because it's built directly from our source, it's always consistent um, with the source. We also have a graphical version of that same page, and this is clickable and hyperlinkable that, that shows the autonomy objects in, in a graphical format and shows this is an example of a rule that calls this macro, this macro sets a storage variable and so on. And, and you can navigate through that. Now, I'll, I'll show that here in a little bit. Um, so uh, kind of as an example, we, I'm going to create a, a simple spacecraft with, with one rule. Um, so imagine we have a requirement um, that says something along the lines, you know, the autonomy system shall power cycle the star tracker if its power consumption exceeds eight watts. We want it to be a programmable value. And if the problem repeats itself, um, then we want to just go ahead and power it off. And we only want this to apply when we're in operational mode. So that, that, that might be a typical set of requirements. And the way that would look when we are um, coding up our autonomy system, um, that if, if you go back and take a look, this, this was six, or I'll show here, that we, to, to detect the, the power consumption, so here's some data we have from the spacecraft. We have Star Trek or current and we have bus voltage. So we're going to create a computed telemetry called um, Star Trek or power. That's Star Trek or current times bus voltage. So just a simple formula, but this is the way we, we would actually code this up as a computed telemetry. So now we have Star Trek or power. We want to detect if its power exceeds eight watts. 
uh, but we, we want that to be programmable. So we can define a storage variable called star tracker power limit with the initial value of eight. And then when we code this autonomy rule, we can now say if this current telemetry, this is that derived telemetry point for power, if that's greater than this value, which is the storage variable set to eight, and if spacecraft mode is operational, that's the rule condition. And here's the macro response that we want to trigger. If you remember, we said the first time it happens, we want to power cycle. The second time we want to power off. So we can use another storage variable to be an error counter for how many times this has occurred. And we'll initialize that to zero. So the first time through, we'll call a sub macro called power cycle the star tracker. And this is that macro here. If it's the second time through or greater, then we're just going to go ahead and power off the star tracker. And then we'll increment this counter so it'll have the proper value uh, the next time through. So that's kind of a, a simple uh, autonomy example with we've got a, a rule, a computed telemetry, two macros, two storage variables. Uh, what that would look like when we code this up looks something like that. This is the definition of the autonomy rule. Here are the six objects here. So here's the autonomy rule coded up with the, with the power greater than this limit and we're in operational mode. Here's the definition of a computed telemetry, which is just a simple expression here of current times voltage and, and so on. Here's the macro response with, with if statements and calling sub macros and, and the power cycle macro and so on down the line. Um, so, so that's what we would uh, develop uh, as far as the, on the autonomy side for the implementation. And so I've taken the, I've gone ahead and coded that up, um, coded those up. And what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna go ahead and do a build so, of the autonomy system. So this is our typical directory structure. We have a directory with rules, macros, computed symmetry, and storage variables. And, and rules we, is where we put rule definitions, macros, macro definitions, and so on. So, uh, so this is kind of the, the current di uh, directory structure here. And I'm just gonna do a make and boom, boom, and done, it's built. So we have built um, objects that would be ready to be loaded um, to the spacecraft. Um, so, so here it's building it's building rules, computed telemetry, macro storage variables. But what I wanted to talk about is part of our build process. It automatically generates um, a web page that that is tied to those source files. So, uh, so for this fight software workshop, I'll refresh. So you can see the time is 19:02 Zulu. So it's legit. Um, so we've just built this. This is showing our entire autonomy system. So if I click on autonomy rule listing, we just have one rule, um, but I can click down in this rule and see this is the rule I coded. So this is a, the, as I coded the rule, um, it automatically will reference it. It will tell me which computed telemetry and storage variables if there are some that are referenced by this rule. Here's the response command. So I can navigate to the command and I can see Here's the response macro that runs. This is the macro that says if it's the first time through, call this power cycle macro. If it's the second time through, power off the star tracker. And I can navigate through. This is calling a sub macro. I can navigate to it. And here's the macro that is powering off. Wait 10 seconds, power on. That's the power cycle. Um, and, and so we the our tools also produce a graphical view. So this is a graphical view of, of that same thing. Here's the, the autonomy rule here in the middle. Um, the, the computed telemetry that's the star tracker power feeds it, the limit, the eight watt limit feeds it. Um, here's our macro, here's the sub macro, and here's the counter that, that can, that's both read and incremented by this macro. Um, so that kind of is, is what, it, what uh, you know, what it looks like for, for those of us, both the implementers as well as other subsystems and, and things that that, um, that that are interested in, in being able to understand and look at what our current autonomy implementation is. For some of our more complex missions, so this is what it would look like on a mission that, that has hundreds of rules. So this is Parker Solar Probe. So the autonomy rule listing instead of one rule is, you know, is, is hundreds of rules that are varying all, you know, are, that are verifying the health of all the various aspects of the system. This is similar listing here for macros. These are all the macros in the system and so on. These are the storage variables in the system with their initial values here and the computed telemetry in the system. Um, so with our website, we also have the ability, we, um, 
you may have noticed with um, one of the attributes um, when we define our autonomy rules is what we call subsystem. And for all the all of the definitions here, I've marked them as Star Trek. But for a large system, we can we can um, we can filter on those. So this subsystem has 400 autonomy rules. But if I only want to see the rules associated with Whisper, which happens to be one of the instruments on this system, I can just see that. And I can see oh, it's just these six rules, just these six macros, and I can go to a graphical view and take a look at a graphical view of the rules just associated with Whisper. Um, and on any of these, I can click on the rule and I can navigate down. I can look at this macro. I can see which macros call this rule. I can navigate up. I can see which rules call this macro. I can navigate higher. I can see computed telemetry thesis and so on. So it allows us to be able to, uh, to navigate um, through the system. So, um, so we've been using this, um, this system for, uh, for the better part of, of about 25 years. It actually started back in 1996 with the NEAR mission. That was the first. Um, we've, we've made incre incremental enhancements over the years to the, over to the engine and our tool set. Our tools and, and the onboard engine is a lot more robust uh, now than it was in the past. Uh, but you can get a feel for the, we, the number of rules, which kind of varies depending on the complexity of the mission. Um, but we've got uh, nine missions um, where it has launched. We have two missions that are uh, being designed right now that are being launched later this decade. I'm mapping Dragonfly, so it'll be number 10 and number 11. So um, it's it served us well. It's given us the ability to, uh, to, to really scale autonomy systems for, for, for fairly simple spacecraft, low Earth orbit spacecraft like Van Allen probes and very complex spacecraft like Parker Solar Probe. So it's, it's been pretty scalable. And again, we've, we've continued to make some incremental improvements over the years, uh, but, but it has uh, served as well. And on that note, I will open it up to any questions. All right, thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, looks like we have time for a couple of questions, so I'm gonna right. uh, read a few. Uh, so the first question is, this tool seems very extensive, so much, so that it seems as though you have a domain specific language that configures the flight software and a GUI that works with that DSL. Have you been able to create a debugger or IntelliSense style system so that this DSL can be edited like code or is the GUI sufficient? Do you find onboarding is difficult due to the domain specific nature of the tooling? Um, yeah, so that's yeah, kind of a loaded, a lot of thing, a lot of moving parts in that question. Um, yeah, as, as for the language, um, so it, it is, it is kind of a custom language per se. However, let me uh, I'll try to give, give an example. I actually anticipated this question. The, the tool set is somewhat, it, we've tried to make the tool set as generic as possible. So for example, we use a particular ground system here at APL, a commercial ground system. Um, but let's say you, you, you use uh, 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 Python or something like that. So our, just about everything that tool builds, like this is an example of what we call the rule template file. And this template is written specifically for the ground software that we use. But you could, so int and begin and so on. If you change this template to a Python, you can produce Python load scripts that can then load on a Python system or whatever. We've actually changed ground system at APL since going all the way back to near and, and what we're doing now. Um, so we, um, so we've tried to make, uh, you know, make things as generic as possible and or ex as extensible as possible. Um, we, the, the tool set we are, um, we're, we, we're trying, we, in APLs, we're, we're trying to play a little catch up uh, with industry a little bit with some of our software in the loop simulators and things like that, where we can run that autonomy engine in a software in the loop simulator and be able to exercise it using uh, you know, using, you know, these types of tools, because we can build for almost, we can build for almost any kind of a platform. It does assume that we have that onboard autonomy engine. Uh, but if we had that, we think we, our tools can build it for, for any kind of a platform. Okay. Um, do you have a rule verification engine that checks for conflicting rules? Yeah, we do. So we have, it's called the autonomy system consistency checker. So we, we have a tool that when we run, it will, 
it's a static kind of like a static link tool. It will look at things like, hey, do we have rules that call macros that don't exist? We have macros that access storage variables that don't exist. We have orphaned objects, the object that we've defined that's not referenced by anything. So we do have static analysis tools that we've written um, that that help oops, um, that help 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 provide that kind of first level uh, check for internal consistency. Okay. And unfortunately, we have many more questions, but we are out of time and we will move those over to the Slack. Okay, uh, and I'll hop on the Slack. All right, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adrian. Uh, thank you very much.